So go ahead and grab your Bibles uh, this morning and turn to Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be at today. We'll be uh, finishing up uh, the chapter uh, by looking at verses 32 to 37. And today uh, the title of the message is Three Marks of a Great Church. Three Marks of a Great Church. I would say that it's safe to bet that nobody sets out in life to be mediocre, right? Anybody in here, if I ask for a show of hands, uh, who early on in life says, I want to be average, I want to be mediocre, I want to just barely skate by in life. Anybody? Anybody set out to do that? I didn't think so. I don't see any hands up anywhere uh, in this room. Nobody starts out to do that. See, nobody works hard to just be average you see nobody wants to be an average student right nobody strives for that nobody wants to be an average athlete or an average employee or an average husband or a wife if you're married see we all want to excel at everything in our lives i would hope that all of us would have those type of things that we all tend to to strive to be great in all the, uh, the that we uh, intend to do that's our goal that's what we uh, we we will be learning about this morning striving to be a great church striving for greatness as a body of christ you see the greatness of the church has nothing to do with the size or the beauty of the building right it has nothing to do with that whatsoever it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do with how uh, great or how wonderful the music is though that is nice it doesn't have to do with uh, how many programs that, that that church offers or even how engaging and relative the preaching is that has nothing to do with how great a church is in a biblical sense but unfortunately, that has become the gauge in today's culture. It's, it's all about me, and it's all about uh, having a consumer-driven model of church, right? That, that's what, what do I like? What do I want? And I determine what is great in a church. But see, we're to look to the Word of God to see what the Word of God says. That uh, if you look at the Bible, that's not what the Bible determines. That's not what the Bible says about what is a great church or not. The Bible should always be what we use to determine what is great and what is pleasing to God. You see, if you're new to reading your Bible, and I know some of you have uh, been reading the Bible for years and some of you are just now starting out or maybe you're just now becoming devoted to reading the Bible and really digging into the Scriptures, uh, let me warn you, it's probably not what you were expecting. It's probably not what you were expecting once you get in there and start reading the text. You see, I was shocked when I was a new believer as I began to read the Bible for myself that it was very very forthcoming with the imperfections and the failures of the of the people of God it, and it, it never seemed to edit anything out you know some people believe that the Bible has been tampered with and it's been manipulated to you know to, 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 to you know to control the people to you know to uh, make God look a certain way or to give power to the church and all that stuff like that but as you read the Bible you see it's not edited at all there's some very embarrassing things. You see, there's some very negative things, especially in regards to some of the prominent figures uh, that we look to in the Bible. And so uh, when I see these things, when I, when I see that the, 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 the people of God in the Bible aren't perfect, it gave me great hope. Because I felt like I didn't measure up. I wasn't measuring up, so I got uh, great hope from seeing those things. I found out as I read the Bible, you know what? I'm a normal Christian. I'm a normal Christian that I still struggle with sin. I still think things that I should not think. I still say things I should not say. I still do things I should not do. I still find myself laughing at things I should not be laughing at. And I am far from being a perfect Christian. And neither are you. And neither are you. And should we draw comfort in that. And therefore we are, are far, far from being a perfect church. But that should not keep us from striving to be a great church. A great church, a church that, that God can use. That yes, we're still limited by our fallenness, by our flesh. That these bodies of death, as the Apostle Paul uh, called them in Romans 7. But we should all be striving to be conformed to the image of Christ. Both as individuals and as a church. So the question is, how do we do this? How can we accomplish this? How, where do we look at, for our an example? The answer is this. We look to Christ and we look to His Word. That's how we know. The Bible doesn't just show us uh, everything that is wrong in our life. The Bible also shows us how to do things the right way, the way that God would have us to do. And our passage here this morning gives us a glimpse into how the early church functioned. They were not perfect either by a long shot. And yet, with the Spirit of God and the power of God, they achieved greatness in the eyes of God. You see, this was the way that God intended for His people to love and care for one another. This was the, the way that the church was supposed to be ordered for effective discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. 
You see, this utopian state that we see in our text today uh, will, uh, that, that, that will not last very long. We'll see in the, in the next few chapters that things fall apart rather quickly. But yet we can still learn and apply these same three principles to our church today if we strive to be a great church. We need to be unified. We need to be sound in doctrine. And we need to be compassionate. So go ahead and grab your Bible, if you have it, and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses uh, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joses, uh, who's also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Father, we are so grateful for this day that you have given us. And Father, I'm thankful for this passage. I'm thankful for the example of the early church, God, how things were in the beginning, and, and the unity and the love and, and the compassion that they had for one another, Lord. Uh, God, I want that for us. I want that to be what describes Occupy Number 2 Baptist Church. So Father, help us to be the church that you want us to be. Help us to desire to be great in your sight. And Father, we know we can't do any of this apart from you. So God, help us to be exactly what you have called us to be. Move us today. Move us from mediocrity to greatness. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing we see in our text this morning is that a great church strives to be unified. Right? Strives to be unified. Right there in the beginning of the first part of 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And so why is it? Why is unity so important for us as a church? Why is that so important? Why does the Scriptures over and over again come back to this topic? You see, first off, I would say that it brings honor and glory to God when His people are able to set aside their personal opinions and their personal preferences and submit completely to His will, right? It brings honor and glory to God whenever His church is unified. And secondly, we can get a whole lot more accomplished working together than we can working on our own or against one another. Amen? Pulling together as a team. I think about an illustration of, of, uh, you know, last year we had a lot of flooding up here. And and in the south it's just common to have hurricane season and all those things. And and I think about sandbagging. Sandbagging a house. Anybody ever had to sandbag a house by themselves? I haven't either, but I can imagine it's pretty rough. You know, so as a church would come about and you say as an individual would it be harder for somebody to sandbag alone or sandbag together you know you can imagine if you're doing it by yourself you have to you know get the bag and you have to hold the bag open you have to get the shovel and try to uh, put the shovel in the mouth of the bag and dump the sand then you got to set the shovel down then you got to tie the bag then you got to pick the bag up then you got to carry it to wherever you want to put it right lots of things lots of labor you know stopping and going but what if you had a whole team of people what if you had a whole crew of people we had somebody that just stayed there somebody stayed there at the sand pile and they held bags and another person owned a shovel another person would tie them then you have this chain gang that would take the bag just pass it from one to the other and place it where you needed it right wouldn't that be a whole lot easier right that's working in unity that's getting things done working together and having a common goal that's what we're supposed to be as a church to work in that, in that same type of manner you see, a church that is unified will, will seek and, and, and will long to do and accomplish all that the Lord has called it to do. You see that we all had a common problem. Every one of us, the Bible tells us that we have all sinned, right? We all had a common problem and we also had a common destination. The Bible says that we were all condemned in our sin and bound for hell, every single one of us. But we also had a common solution to that problem, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. See, that that we were united in all these things. See, we were united in our condemnation under sin, but we were also uh, united under the blood of Jesus Christ through faith. Amen? And so we have this unity. We have this built into us. 
that those who have served in combat, I think about another example, those who serve together in a military or in a combat situation seem to have a rare bond that few people uh, have anywhere else, right? They've, they've, they've bled together and they've feared for their lives together and they've uh, shared in that experience together. You see that we are also united by the, the working of the Holy Spirit in us, that the, the, the unity that we have are, are knit together by the presence of God working in us through the Holy Spirit. Each one of us uh, has the Holy Spirit that has placed their faith in Jesus Christ if we're not walking in the flesh, if we're walking according to the Spirit. You see, the, the bond of, of brothers and sisters that we have in Christ is even stronger than those that are of, of our natural flesh and blood, that we are a, a forever family. I say it over and over again. I, I know that, that, that I have relationships, flesh and blood. You know, I have aunts and uncles and I have cousins and, and, and people that I'm, I'm flesh and blood related to that I'm much, much closer with my family of God. I am much, much closer. I'm much more united. I have uh, much more in common with with the people of God, and I do my flesh and blood, blood, flesh and blood family. And of course, undoubtedly, this was what Luke is describing here in verse 32, that the, the early church exploded onto the scene in the, at the day of Pentecost with 3,000 coming to faith in Christ, and then shortly thereafter, thousands more were added there under Peter's uh, uh, powerful preaching. And I would say in most cases, uh, it, it's likely that the, uh, these new converts uh, were complete strangers. Right? They, they were. They, there's no way. They come from all over the place, and they came there for the, the, the festival season, so they, they probably didn't know each other whatsoever. The only thing they had in common was their rejection of works-based uh, r- righteousness through repent, the, the teachings of Judaism and their acceptance of, of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all that they had in common. But that was enough. Faith in Christ was enough. The gospel had radically transformed everything about them their hearts and souls is what the verse tells us. You see, the heart and soul was used to describe the, the depths of who we are. When we say that we love somebody, when you say, I love you with all my heart and all my soul, what does that mean? There's no deeper expression of your love, right? That, that there's nothing deeper that you could offer to someone. You see, the early church was unified in their belief in Jesus Christ and His gospel. They were unified in advancing the gospel to see their forever family continue to grow and expand to reach every tribe, nation, and tongue. And that should be our goal as well. We should have that same unified purpose. You see, don't be under the illusion that every believer saw eye to eye on everything that they, uh, uh, that they, they, they had agreed on, that they agreed on every issue. Right? That's not the case. That's not what I think we see in the text is that, that uh, they were uh, not a bunch of uh, Christian clones. They, they had their disagreements, I'm sure. And I think that we are making a huge mistake by insisting that we all agree on everything, right? That's what happens in the church, that, that sometimes that we just, you're, you're going to have to do it our way. This is how we do things, and you're going to do it our way. It's our way or the highway, uh, all those things. And we just put those things, we put these rigid barriers up and say it has to be like this or else. And you know what happens? The people take the R else and they leave. And they go somewhere else. They will go to another place. You see that we, that we, 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 we make these things where we have to like the same music. We have to like the same Bible translation. We have to read the same books and educate our, our children the same way. Have the same personal convictions and have the same political leanings. Listen to this quote I found as I prepared this week. It says, The insistence that others be just like us is one of the most dis unifying mindsets a church can have because it instills a judgmental inflexibility that hurls people away from the church with lethal force. One of the wonders of Christ is that he honors our individuality while bringing us into unity, right? That we are different and we have different uh, desires and different wants, but we come together under Christ, right? See, it's it's, it's, it's this, this, uh, this, the, my way or the highway, those type of things, and, and this, that, that flexibility that, that brings this unity to our churches. It's the, it's the opposite of seeking unity. You see, that, that's childish. We're, we're not willing to work together and compromise whatsoever. It, that's, what a, that's what a two-year-old does, right? Mine, mine, mine. It's my way. Everything's got to be about me. And lots of our churches are just like that. Or just like that. And, you know, you know I've been here longer, and, and, and this is the way I like it, and we're going to do it my way. And if you don't like it, too bad. That's not what we see. That's not what we see in the Scriptures. That's not what we see, especially in our passage here this morning. 
You see, the Apostle Paul knew that the key to unity in the church was for its members to esteem one another, to have a servant's mentality. Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of, of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. There's that word again, unity. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Do you see the problem in many churches is that we want to look out for our own interest, right? All we care about is us. And, and are we doing what I want? Is, are things done my way? Are we playing the kind of music I like? Are we playing the songs I want to hear, right? That's the hindrance, the lack of unity. You see, what united the early church was not just their common affiliation to Christ. It was their willingness to focus on the mission instead of their own interest. You see, if we're going to be a great church, we must strive to be unified in who we believe Jesus Christ to be and why we exist as a church. Why are we here? To love God, to love people, and to make disciples. Right? That's why we're here. That's what we're here for. You see, we don't have to agree on everything, but we must agree on the essentials of our faith if we're to ever to truly be united and useful to the advancement of the gospel. Amen? We must agree on those things. A great church strives to be unified. Point number two, a great church strives to be sound in doctrine. Right? Verse 33 says this, and, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You see, nothing is as destructive to a church as false doctrine. Nothing. Either intentionally or unintentionally, false doctrines will poison and corrupt a church. You know, nearly every book of our New Testament, as we, as we read through, uh, mention false teachers and, and, and false teachings. That we see everything from a, a flat-out denial of Jesus as being God uh, to adding good works to faith for salvation, right? The whole Jesus plus uh, teachings that are out there. You see, bad doctrine flourishes and only happens where the people of God do not know their Bibles. Right? If you do not know your Bibles, you will fall prey easily. Or another problem is the people of God do not take the, take the teachings of the Bible seriously. We look at the Bible as just a, a bunch of suggestions. Right? That God doesn't really mean that. He kind of, you know, it's kind of a, just a, a baseline or kind of a, a grid work for us to work on. When I think about one of the most prominent and, and, and most destructive uh, teachings that are out there today, a uh, false teaching, is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is basically, uh, you know, I, I can't even imagine how, uh, how else could a, a, a name it and claim it prosperity gospel be so prevalent unless these things are happening, unless people don't know their Bibles. You see, the, the, the core of that doctrine is that God wants all of his people to be healthy and wealthy at all times, right? That's what it is. And that sounds great. It sounds wonderful. I like it. Doesn't that sound good to you? Don't you want to be healthy and wealthy all the time? Don't you want to never have a, 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 any sickness or any discomfort or a runny nose? Or, or do you just want like a, just an just a, a, a endless bank account, right? Just full all the time, never have any concerns. Can just go wherever you want to go, do what you want to do. Doesn't that sound great? That sounds wonderful, right? It's like you have your best life now, right? That's not what the Bible teaches, is it? We don't see that in the scriptures, do we? Is that, is that what we see played out in the, in the Word of God? You know, is that what we see in the New Testament? We see that the church is diverse. We do see that. We see that there were a few wealthy people, right? But the vast majority of early Christians were poor. They were working class farmers and fishermen. And we also see uh, beatings and afflictions and imprisonments and, and quite often death because of, of the gospel and the faith in Jesus Christ. We think of Jesus himself was crucified. We think of the disciples, 11 of the 12 were killed for their faith, and then John was exiled. You see, what I'm saying, church, is what we believe matters. What we believe matters. What you are being taught matters. It is not enough that you're a member of a church. You better be a member of a church that teaches and preaches sound doctrine. Amen? That's what you need to make sure that you're a part of. Not the latest and greatest psychology. You see, we need to be under the explicit teachings of the Word of God. As Paul said in 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see what we need, church? We need men and women who will spend time in study and in prayer seeking to know the right interpretation of the Scriptures through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to teach Sunday school and discipleship classes and to preach from this pulpit. That's what we need. That's what you need. That's what I need. We all need to be studying and praying on our own and helping one another to know the Scriptures better, to grow from babes that can only handle milk so that we can handle the solid food, the meat of the Word of God. And I would ask you to please, please, please pray for me daily. Pray for me daily to understand the Word of God as I prepare and study to preach the Word of God to you each week, that I would always be sound in my doctrine. You see, Luke tells us that the apostles preached with great power. That's what he means when he says that they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit embolden them to speak the truth of the resurrection of jesus christ you see it's not enough to proclaim the death of jesus though we do that it's necessary to to, to speak and preach the death of jesus right and, and and we we preach the death we preach the cross we preach the blood we're not one of those churches that have done away with those things but the resurrection of jesus is also vital to sound doctrine it's critical it's critical, and, and we know from our past studies that the resurrection was rejected by many there in Jerusalem, especially among the ruling council. You see, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no gospel. There is no gospel. If the tomb was still full, if the, if the stone was not rolled away and his body was still there, there would be no atonement for our sins, that we would all still be under condemnation. The resurrection matters. And, and Paul dealt with this false teaching in the church there in Corinth in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verses 12 to 19 says this. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. The resurrection matters. The resurrection matters. That's that's a cornerstone of our faith. You see where the Bible is being taught and taught rightly, great grace is being poured out. Right? Not everybody has this experience in the church. They don't not have this same blessing to have sound doctrine. You see, some places have given themselves over to, 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 to uh, uh, ear ticklers, motivational speakers that just want to say things to make everybody happy, make you feel good all the time, and, and wanna, don't want to address sin, don't want to call people to repent and confess their sins. And so where the Word of God is being taught and taught rightly, great grace is being poured out. That's what this text tells us you see it's through the sound preaching of the gospel that people are saved that's an act of god's grace right for the for the preaching of the word of god and the gospel to be shared as an act of god's grace it's also through the sound teaching of the word of god that we are sanctified that we're made more and more like christ and this too is also an act of god's grace you see god's grace not only saved us from an eternal hell god's grace has set us free from the bondage of sin and makes us into new people 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, the unity and love that's demonstrated by those first Christians made placing one's faith in a resurrected Jesus Christ very attractive. That the people there saw what was going on amongst the people of God, those, those peoples of the way, those, those followers of Jesus uh, love one another and serve one another and we were willing to sacrifice for one another and people wanted to know what was going on people wanted to be a part of that you see that kind of unity and love are the fruits of sound doctrine that doesn't happen where error is being taught god will not bless a church that does those things you see sound doctrine draws some people but it also repels others did you know that and sometimes sound doctrine, preaching the word of God, will draw some people and will repel others, will turn some others away. That some churches grow because of sound doctrine. 
right? They grow because of sound doctrine. People want to come and be fed by the Word of God, but then some churches shrink because of sound doctrine. Do you have a church that goes from, from, from just being an entertainment church and, and kind of a feel-good church and just taking trips and, and doing all these fun things and activities, right? Feel-good messages week after week, and all of a sudden you start preaching the real Word of God. Guess what? <laughs> it kind of thins out. It kind of thins out. People don't want that. People don't want to hear the Word of God. People want to be entertained. And so they'll go somewhere else or they won't go nowhere at all. They'll just find somewhere, some channel on, on, on satellite and they'll find an entertainer, somebody there that can make them laugh and make them feel good in their sin at home and never have to come to church anymore. You see, pastors and teachers will be held account for what they teach and preach. Did you know that? Not just me. If you, if you teach the Word of God, you will be held accountable. And James gave a warning about this. James 3, 1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Right? We're all going to answer. We're all going to give an account to God for what we have done, how we have taught, how we have preached the Word of God. You see, if something is being taught or preached that is out of line with the Bible, that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed. There's a time and a place to address that, depending on the severity of what is being done, but it must be addressed. We must be a church that expects and require sound doctrine from this pulpit and from our classrooms. Amen? We must have that. It is non-negotiable. A great church strives to be sound in doctrine. And lastly, our, our third thing that we see from our text this morning is that a great church strives to be compassionate. Strives to be compassionate. This is a 32b and then 34 uh, to 37 says, that Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, and they had all things in common. And dropping down to 34, it says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of the things uh, that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone has needed. And and Joses, uh, who also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see, our, our first priority as a church is to proclaim the gospel with our lips right? That's it. That, that, that faith comes by hearing by, and by hearing the Word of God, right? We need to, to be about inviting people to respond to the grace of God. You see, that's the most compassionate thing that we can do, right? That's the most compassionate thing that we can do to anyone is extend God's grace and the forgiveness of sins. But our compassion must go much further than sharing the gospel. We have to do much more than that, that we cannot claim to love people and then ignore their needs when we have the ability to help. Listen to me. Prayers do not fill an empty stomach. Prayers do not fill an empty stomach. When somebody comes to you with a need and says that we're out of food and, and the kids are hungry, they don't need you to say, let me tell you what, we'll put you on our prayer list. Or better yet, let me tell you what, I'm going to pray for you. Right, let me pray for you right now. Can I pray with you? They don't need your prayer. You know what they need? They need food. Right? Meet the need. Meet the need. Quoting Bible verses don't put clothes on someone's back. You see, again, Jesus' brother James addressed this absurdity in his letter he, he, he got it he understood this james 2 15 and 16 says if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them depart in peace be warmed and filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body what does it profit doesn't make any sense right right they don't need your prayers they don't need you to quote scripture they need food they need help they need clothes they need shelter they need whatever the concern is of the day they need you to meet that need. You see, and, and, and John would go even further. He'd go even further. He would question whether or not you're even a Christian if you lack the compassion to help someone out when they're in a time of need, especially a fellow believer. 1 John three sixteen and 17 says this, By this we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It doesn't make sense. That's what he's saying. It doesn't make any sense. How in the world could you look at somebody in need of, 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 of things, food or shelter or clothes or, or whatever the case is, and just turn your back and, and not care, not do anything about it? It doesn't make any sense. That is about the most unchristian thing that you can think of. So let me ask you this. Is being generous with your money easy or is it hard? 
Right? Is, it, is it easy or is it hard? You see, if we could uh, truly come to grips with the fact that we are stewards of what God has given us and that everything belongs to God, generosity would become a whole lot simpler, wouldn't it? If we, if we could have that type of mindset. You see, this is what Luke depicts here in the early days of the Jerusalem church. We see an open display of unselfishness and loving care for one another that has rarely uh, been seen since. Now, Pastor John MacArthur, he, he zeroes in on, on how this was possible for them. He says this, says, They all understood that everything they had belonged to God, and they possessed it in trust for Him. Since all belonged to God, when someone had a need, they were obligated to use the divine resources to meet that need. Obligated. We are under obligation that's a great way to look at it we are under obligation to help one another out you see some people wrongly see what's going on here in our text as a form of communism right have you ever heard that before that that sounds like a whole lot like communism where we we sell all our stuff and we live in a commune and we make a pile and we kind of just share everything that's what they say and that's not true because you if that's what you believe then you don't understand the difference between communism and christianity see communism communism says what's yours is everyone's right that's what communism says communism takes christianity says what's mine is yours right or christianity gives you see the difference one takes and one gives right that's that's the difference between communism and what we see here in our early uh church see this was all voluntary this was all voluntary. Nowhere do we see that the apostles uh, were commanding anyone to sell their houses or their land. See, if, if it were mandatory, there would be no reason to, to mention Barnabas, right? They, they named uh, him specifically for what he had done. You see, it would have been just normal to sell land and bring those things to the apostles for prayerful distribution. You see, in fact, this, this is the only time that we see uh, in, in the Scriptures uh, where Christians are, are liquidating their assets to meet the needs of others. We don't see this anywhere else. This is the only time we see it in our Bibles, in, in the book of Acts here, in, in the church here in Jerusalem. You see, this was an extreme outpouring of love for one another, where, where the well-being of others was more important than personal comfort or financial security. You see, compassion for others was a tremendous witness of Christ there in the early church, and it still is today, right? When people see a church that cares, people want to be a part of that. You see, many people have come to faith in Jesus Christ through a simple act of compassion. A simple act of compassion, a, a, a bottle of water, a box of clothes, a, a bag of groceries, all these things. And when, when trouble hits, when hurricanes come, when flood, floods come and, and the church moves into communities to help out, lots of people have been led to Christ through that compassion, those, those kind and generous acts of the church. You see, just simply being willing to help someone in their time of need uh, means so much. You see, that's what Jesus did for you and me on the cross, right? We had a great need. We had something we could not do for ourselves, that we were condemned in our sins with no way of saving ourselves. And Christ met that need through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so I just say this to you this morning. When you think about, wow, well, I'm not sure about all this, Brother Mike. That's a, you know, selling houses and lands and, and, and giving money away and just kind of, man, I, I don't know if I can, you know, that's just a little bit too much to ask. Let me just say this. Isn't seeing someone come to saving faith in Jesus Christ uh, worth us sacrificing our time, our money, our comfort, our security? Isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it? How much can you put a price on somebody's soul? Isn't it worth it to, to, to experience the loss of some of these things that we say they belong to God anyway, right? We don't own anything. We say that, right? Everything belongs to God. So I'd say this. Maybe it's time we start acting like we actually believe that. Right? Maybe it's time we start actually living like we believe that. You see, a great church strives to be compassionate. Strives to be compassionate. So closing this morning, as I said, as I began, no church strives, out, strives to be mediocre. Nobody sets out and says, man, I'm, I'm looking to plant a church and I can't wait to see what God's going to do here, but not too much. Mediocre is fine. Just, just to be average, just another average church out there on, on the landscape. But see, it's not hard for that to happen. And I don't know that anybody does it on purpose, but because maybe it happens because being great takes hard work. It does. It, ta- it takes a lot of hard work. That, that greatness in anything takes commitment, and, and greatness requires us willing to sacrifice. If you look to any world-class athlete out there, if you uh, look to any of, the, of your uh, elite NFL or, or NBA players, 
their life is, is marked by commitment and sacrifice, right? They, they don't go out and, and, and eat whatever they want. They, they are disciplined what they put in their body. They spend hours and hours in the gym. They spend hours and hours shooting free throws. They spend hours and hours catching balls, whatever the case. Their lives are marked by commitment and sacrifice. They do what it takes. They don't get to do all the things everybody else gets to do because that is the most important thing to them, to be the, gra- the greatest at what they do. So we must choose to be a great church if we're able to be a great church. We must choose to be a great church if we're ever to be a great church. You see, the early Jerusalem church was a great church in the very beginning, but that did not last very long. But we can still learn from them. You see, I don't want us to be a great church just for the sake of being a great church. That's not what I want. I don't want just to, you know, I don't want to just see a bunch of people here. And that, that would be great. I would love to see this place just, just packed with people week after week worshiping God and desiring to hear his word. I would love to see that. But I want us to be a great church because God seems to, be, to bless and add to those churches that strive to be great. If we look back to Acts chapter 2 earlier on in our study, verse 47b says this, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. All, right, all these things, and when we strive to be a great church, when we strive to be obedient to what God has called us to be, He will do the work. He will add to the church daily those who are being saved. So let's strive for greatness. Let's strive to be a great church. Let's strive to be unified. Let's focus on Jesus and the mission of the gospel. Let's strive to, to, to be sound in, in doctrine. You know, what we teach and believe matters more than we can possibly know. And let's strive to be compassionate. All right, let's demonstrate our love and, and sacrificial living and giving to the needs of others. Those are three marks of a great church. Three marks of a great church. Are they, are they happening here? And if not, we need to make some changes. You see, we worship a great God, and He deserves a great church. Amen? He deserves the best. Let's pray, and we'll have a time of response.